Well, good morning, Central family, and to any guests tuning in maybe for the first time, a special welcome to you. Thank you for joining with us for our worship service this morning. I'm Tom, I'm the Children's Ministry Director here at Central Baptist Church, aka the big kid. And well, kids, did you know this Sunday is also special because it's Father's Day? Yeah. So right now, if you're like, "Uh uh-oh, I totally forgot, well, go find Dad, give him a big hug, tell him you love him, and I thir- I mean, I'm sure everything will be okay. As long as you're you know, well-behaved for the rest of the day, too, that will also help. And seeing as it's also Father's Day, in true Dad fashion, I'm wearing my Hawaiian shirt, and you can't see it, but I'm wearing socks and sandals. Yeah, I'm living Dad large, and I figured I'm allowed one Dad joke, right, Pastor Phil? One Dad joke, so here goes, brace yourself, brace yourselves. This one comes from Ed, my friend, who some of you know from the church, the Labonte family, so a little disclaimer. I just bought controlling stock in old McDonald's farm. I guess that now makes me the C-I-E-I-O. Ouch, I know it hurts. Tom, please just read the scripture and move on. Okay, I will do that. All right, this morning also, because it's Father's Day, I thought a fitting passage of scripture just to read for this morning's call to worship would be Proverbs 3, uh, specifically verses 1 to 12. Because here we see uh, King Solomon, right, reciting this wisdom to his children in the hopes that they would follow the Lord. And so as I read this, I'd hope we just listen to the sincerity in his voice, just thinking like the best thing I can do as a dad is to point them to our Lord and Savior. So here goes, starting in verse one. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you, Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord, and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him who he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. King Solomon's telling us, fix your eyes on the Lord. Let him be your vision and follow him with your life. i mm-hmm. 
Yo 
Well, God, you're so good, you're so good to me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. say yes to who you are, to all that you've done for us in Jesus Christ. May this message of your truth permeate our hearts and change us forever. 
We thank you that you are completely dependable, that your word is reliable. We look to you now and we say, God, we praise your name. In the name of Jesus, we say this together. Amen. Amen. Well, happy Father's Day, everyone. We know that fathers play such a crucial role in the lives of so many people. And today, we want to take a few moments to just say thank you to all of our dads. So let's take a moment to watch this video. We are going to try this again with my microphone on. <laughs> Sorry about that. My name is Phil. We're very glad to welcome you to our Central Baptist uh, Father's Day Sunday morning service this morning. And uh, we're, let me add my welcome to Tom's welcome earlier. Uh, and uh, we're very glad you're here. We would love for you to connect with us. You can go to our website and click on the connect button and you can reach us in that way and just let us know that you're out there and ask any questions you would like. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, a, a, a transition Sunday. I'll talk about that in a moment, but uh, we're very glad you're here with us today. It is with deep sorrow that uh, we bring to your attention, in case you haven't heard already, that our sister Liz Morgan passed away to be with the Lord on Thursday of this week. Uh, Ron and their two sons were with her, and the passing was peaceful. But please do, please do bring Ron and the boys to the Lord in your prayers, especially in this time. At Liz's request, there will not be a memorial service, but uh, let's, as a church family, come around this family and pray for them and love them well during this season of grieving for Ron and the boys. This coming summer, as the rules are changing and things are opening up again, we are planning to do an in-person urban adventures camp this year, and that's going to be July 19th to 24th. There is still room to register, so kids, if you haven't registered yet, uh, this is the week to do that. Uh, there's also some volunteers still needed. We have a good number of volunteers already. We're looking especially for some volunteers to help in the food department, I'm told. So uh, if you would like to help, please contact Tom Drinkwater, and he would be very glad for your volunteer hours in that week of July 19th to the 24th. Next Sunday, June 27th at 1 p.m., there will be a membership class. This will be a Zoom class. If you are interested in becoming a member here at Central Baptist Church, please contact the church office this week to sign up or to ask any further questions about the membership class next Sunday. Speaking of next Sunday, next Sunday is the Sunday when we're planning to do our limited reopening according to the rules from British Columbia. And uh, so that 
that's important for you to pay attention to, to how to do this. The main thing for you to know is that tomorrow morning early, there will be a button on our website that you can click that says register. And so uh, you can go to our website as early as probably seven o'clock in the morning and see that button there. And uh, you, can, you can register. It will be first come and uh, first serve because we have limited numbers. What we're allowed is two groups of 50. One group of 50 will be in the lower hall. One group of 50 will be in the, in the balcony. Uh, once you register, then after that you will be sent a uh, detailed description of which door to come in and all the rules about coming. Uh, let me just make sure that you know that if you come next Sunday that you are required to wear a mask at all times during the service and at this point no singing is allowed in the building by the congregation. And so that's a sadness right now, but we hope temporary, but please do keep this in mind. And uh, as I say, the seating is limited. If you have any questions about this, just give the church office a call tomorrow morning and, uh, or any day through this week. And once the, once the numbers are reached in full, then we will have to cut off the registrations for next Sunday. We'd love to see you here. If you can join us, please do sign up to come. As usual, we want to thank you for your ongoing giving to Central Baptist Church. E-transfer is the most cost-effective way for you to continue to give your, your offerings. Other options include mailing or dropping off a check or using the Tithely app or giving through our website. And now for uh, the kids, we'd invite you to go and find the link that was sent to you earlier this week, a, a link for Right Now Media. It was sent to you earlier in the week. And also youth, we have a, a deeper session today, uh, so you can run along there to the Zoom session uh, beginning very soon. I'm gonna invite Tom to come now and uh, offer a pastoral prayer. Thanks, Pastor Phil. And just before I pray in just a moment, uh, I also want, I forgot in this morning's announcements, kind of the start of the service, we have a special guest speaker this morning. Pastor Paul Park from South Delta Baptist Church will be giving us the message this morning. So in just a moment, I'll turn it over to him. But first, I'd invite you to join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as Pastor Phil just mentioned, uh, with heavy hearts, we do mourn the loss of Liz Morgan. Right now our hearts go out to Ron and the two sons, Mark and Paul. We mourn with them, we miss her, and, but Lord, we thank you for the good news that the family was together in her passing and that they could spend those last minutes cheering each other on. And Lord, right now, if she were here, she would be cheering us on too. So Lord, we thank you that you blessed us with her life, we celebrate it, and we give you the glory because you created her and she's with you now. We thank you for her life's example. We thank you what she's meant to, to Ron and the kids and this whole church. And Lord, we thank you that there is hope, that we, we don't mourn like those that don't have hope, that we will see her again. And so Lord, it's, it's another loss during this COVID season and every loss seems to hurt because we can't gather as a church family to mourn together and to encourage one another. And so Lord, it's just another reminder that you are our sovereign Lord and that we need to turn to you. So Lord, help us to fix our eyes on you to run this race well so that we can receive the crown of life that Liz now has. And Lord, I also want to celebrate you in this Father's Day. We thank you that you are the example of a perfect father. And I thank you, Lord, for all the fathers out there that know the best thing that they can do as a dad is to stand aside and to point to you. Just like in this morning's scripture pack passage with King Solomon, he knew in his wisdom that the best thing he could do for his kids is to point to you. So Lord, thank you for the dads that have done that. Thank you for my dad. Thank you for all the fathers that it's hard to do, but we thank you for your grace and your guidance. And right now, I'm sad, Lord, because I think of all the children, as Corey mentioned, that don't have good examples of a father, that don't have a dad. But Lord, you do stand in the gap, 
You are our Heavenly Father. And thank you, Lord, for all the pastors, the ministers, the laymen, all those that serve you through single mom events, whether fixing vans or serving at Urban Adventures or working in orphanages like Watoto around the world. Thank you for their hearts that they want to see the next generation succeed, and that can only happen if they know you. So Lord, again, we celebrate your love. It's with heavy hearts that we know these things happen, but with joy, we also thank you for the love of dads. In your name we pray, amen. At this point, I'm not gonna turn it over to Pastor, Pastor Paul Park, who's also gonna do the scripture reading. Well, good morning, Central Baptist Church. My name's Paul Park, and I serve as a pastor here at South Delta Baptist Church in Tawasin. We're right by the ferry, so it's not even that far from where you guys are in Victoria. Um, I love sharing the Word of God with anyone who would listen, so today it's a privilege to share God's Word with you. Um, But also, it's a real privilege for me right now because I actually visited your church a couple times and worshipped with you, and I absolutely loved. Every time I would go to Victoria and visit your church, I loved it. And actually, our staff and our whole fellowship family actually were supposed to gather at your church right at the beginning of the pandemic last year. Obviously, it got canceled, but we had our annual convention scheduled to be at Central Baptist Church in Victoria. Our whole team was super excited to go to Victoria and, and be together but it's so sad that we're not able to do that in person. But I'm, I'm very thankful for the technology that allows us to, allows me to serve your church family in this way. So it is absolutely an honor for me to do this. Just for your context, um, I live here in Tawasin, like I said, not far from Victoria. And I used to love going to Victoria for uh, weekend trips or even uh, day trips with my wife, Sarah. This is one of our favorite things to do. We used to go at least once or twice a year. And if time allowed it, we would go multiple times a year. One of our favorite places, of course, has to be Beacon Hill Park. And as we walk around that park, we love visiting Beacon Hill Drive-In for the best soft serve ice cream we've ever had. We're a little bit of a foodie kind of a couple, so absolutely love Pagliacci's, Redfish, Bluefish. Oh, I miss being able to go to Victoria. Obviously, I haven't been able to go for the last year and a half or so, and I miss that great city. So today, as I get to serve you in Victoria, I feel like there's a little bit of a connection here. As I was preparing for the message when Pastor Barton um, asked me to do this, I thought about which text in the Bible would be able to encourage you right now, especially during a pandemic like this. So I looked in the Bible, and, and we, I, I thought Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26 would be an amazing text. So hopefully you're, bl- uh, you're blessed by this. So if you have your Bibles, please open it to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to go through verses 16 through 26. And as you open your Bibles and as you find that passage, I want to give you a little context about myself and my wife, Sarah. So we got married about six years ago, and now we have two beautiful children. Nathan is our oldest. He's four years old now, and we have a daughter named Christiane. And Christiane is just three months old, so you could probably imagine that we are quite a busy young family right now. Life is a little bit chaotic at home, especially with the pandemic. It's not easy, I must admit but we're still thankful and we're absolutely blessed. But one of the things that we noticed was having a family of four now, it's a lot more limiting in what activities that we could do, especially because we have such a young child at home. You know, we once used to love going for walks and we would do that quite frequently. In fact, when Sarah and I first started dating, our our favorite activity to do together was to go on a walk around the beach. We loved White Rock Pier, Crescent Beach, and other places. We even loved going to Victoria and walking around downtown Victoria, Beacon Hill Park, by the water there, and, and we just love walking around. We don't even need a destination, really. Just the fact that we could walk holding hands was a beautiful experience. One of those early days of dating, though, um, my wife Sarah had a knee injury. And in fact, she had three knee surgeries on that knee. So I was very mindful of this. So when we did go for our walks, I was careful to pace myself so that Sarah was comfortable. 
If her knee was doing okay that day, we would go for a little bit of a walk, but we'll still make sure that we take enough rest. If there's a park bench, we would sit down and enjoy our conversations, maybe grab a snack and enjoy our time and then go for a walk again. If she was having a bad day and there was a lot of pain in her knees, of course, we would, we would cut the walk short and we would head into a restaurant or a coffee shop and we would enjoy each other's company that way. The beautiful part of this is, imagine this glorious summer day in Vancouver. As Sarah and I go for a walk, what was most important for us was that we would enjoy each other's company, that we would enjoy this relationship that we were building together, our love. We were celebrating it by enjoying our conversations, walking in God's creation, and enjoying the beauty of God's artwork That was the point of these walks. It wasn't necessarily for us to exercise, although it was great exercise. It wasn't necessarily for us to get to a place, although we ended up having a destination most times. The real point was that we would enjoy each other. The reason I share this is because in today's text in Galatians 5, the Apostle Paul will give the Galatian churches an imagery, a picture, if you will, about us as a church being able to walk with God as we walk in step with the Holy Spirit. So let's read the text today. Keep that image in mind as this beautiful day, Sarah and I walking, enjoying each other. Just imagine that. Here in verse 16, Paul starts, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Amen. Thus far is the reading of God's Word for today. Now, just note here, in three verses of this passage that we read, there's these allusions to the fact that there's a walk happening. There's a walk between the Galatian churches and the Spirit of God. Listen to this again in verse 16. Paul writes, But I say, walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. And then in verse 18, Paul continues, But if you're led by the Spirit, so the Holy Spirit is leading He's walking in front and leading this church. And then again in verse 25, Paul writes, If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Three times. We get a very clear indication. Paul is drawing a picture here. He's depicting the fact that the church is on a walk with God. Reminds me of uh, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, where you see Adam and Eve before the fall of man, they would normally go for walks. That's why in chapter 3 of Genesis, we find that when Adam and Eve sinned, God came looking for Adam and Eve, as he always did, walking with them in the cool of the day in the Garden of Eden. You see, we were always designed and created to walk with God. Maybe not just literally, but figuratively as well. We were supposed to enjoy his beautiful presence. We were never supposed to depart his presence. That happened because of sin and the brokenness that ensued. But the way we were created was to enjoy God's perfect presence in our lives. And Paul's talking about that. 
right? Verses 16, 18, and 25. He's talking about you got to walk by the Spirit. You got to be led by the Holy Spirit, and you got to walk in step, lockstep with the Spirit of God. That's the vision. That's the goal for all humanity. That's the beauty of life. So Paul is telling the Galatian churches, and in turn, he's telling us that we have this opportunity to walk with God. Now, what does that look like, walking with God? Well, I started the sermon by saying that, hey, Sarah and I, my wife and I, we love going for walks. Now, we regret that we can't do it as often as we would like because of our family life stage right now. But when we were dating, man, I couldn't wait. Every day after work, I just wanted to pick up Sarah and go for a nice walk. But think about it. What if I said in those walks, hey, Sarah, I know your knee's a little bit hurting right now, but why don't you sit on the bench and wait? I'm going to go off and do my thing. I got my Fitbit on. I got to make sure I got, I got my steps in today. You know, you, you don't do that. When you're on one of your first dates and you're trying to build this relationship where you're trying to impress this woman, you don't just say, hey, I got I to gotta fit in my steps. You wait here. I'm just going to go and book it. You don't do that, right? Now, when you're married, maybe 10, 20 years, that's what some married couples might do. But for newlyweds, for newly dating couples, this isn't what you do. Now, I want us to imagine Figuratively, when we go for a walk with our Holy Spirit, are we trying to pace our steps so that we're actually in step with the Spirit of God? Or do we just have our own destination and agenda in mind and we want to just get there? We don't care if the Spirit of God is beside us or maybe we left him in, in the back or maybe he's gone and I'm not following. Whatever the case, what Paul is presenting here in Galatians 5 is that we have the opportunity to walk with the Holy Spirit. Did I ever think that walking with my wife was a chore and I didn't want to do it? Absolutely not. I was in love with her, and I still am. So when I walk with her, it's not like, man, Sarah, can't you just keep up? No. When she needs a break, I love sitting on the bench and just talking, hanging out. And when we're ready to go again, love walking again. That's the thing. The destination's important when we go for these walks, but what's really important is standing right beside me, walking with the one whom I love so dearly. And that's the picture that Paul's inviting us into. He's saying the God of the universe wants to walk with you. He wants to journey with you through your life, through the challenges and the joys, through the successes and the failures. He wants to be right there with you. He wants to lead you. He wants to walk alongside you. He wants to support you from behind and help you get, get moving when you're stuck. This is the God that we have, and it's the beauty of this walk that we call the walk of life. And so Paul gives us these pictures. But let's delve into the text a little bit more. Verse 16, Paul starts, I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other. Now, Paul opens up this section like this. Paul says, hey, there's the desires of the flesh, and then there's the desires of the Spirit, and they are opposing each other. They're at odds with each other. Now, you might have expressed this before, but we live in a broken world where sinfulness abounds. And when we live in this broken world as Christ followers, you could imagine that there is opposition between the forces here. There's the brokenness and the sinfulness of this world that wants to pull us away from the presence of God and lead us astray into a, a faraway place where we can't enjoy God and more destructive and broken things happen. And then there's the Spirit of God that indwells us, continuing to lead us to a closer relationship with him so that we may enjoy life, so that we may not do this life alone, but that we may walk closely with him. So Paul says quite plainly, there are oppositions here. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the Spirit of God, they are opposed to each other. You know what this teaches us? It teaches us that we need the Spirit of God if we're going to navigate through the sinful world that we live in. Here's, here's how I would put it. 
when we, when we live through this life, we will inevitably experience brokenness, whether it's in our homes, whether it's in myself internally, whether it's in our workplaces, in our neighborhood, in our communities, even, yes, even in our churches. Because let's admit it, we are, we're a house full of sinners, aren't we? Very desperately dependent on the grace of God. So yes, even in a church, we can experience glimpses of brokenness left and right. So when we are called to live through this faithfully as followers of Christ, what God gives us is his gift. The Bible calls this a gift, a promise from God the Father, and it is his own spirit. Jesus told his disciples, okay, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you, but I will send you the helper. I will send you the counselor. I will send you the spirit, spirit of God himself, who will guide you and lead you and walk alongside you. I will never leave you. You don't need to do this life by yourself. This is the gift God gives. So here's the thing. If you want to live a life pleasing to the Lord and a good life, a faithful life unto the Lord, then we must embrace this idea of walking with the Spirit of God. Because without it, we can't oppose our sinful desires. We can't oppose the desires of our flesh. That's what Paul is talking about. The desires of the flesh are at war with the desires of the Spirit. And therefore, without the Spirit of God in our lives, we will naturally tend towards the desires of the flesh. The only way we can battle sin, the only way we could actually be free from sin, isn't by keeping the law, isn't by just saying, I'll do better next time. It's actually by inviting the Spirit of God into my life and walking closely with Him. See, the problem in the Galatian churches This letter, written by the Apostle Paul, was most likely written to cities that Paul planted churches in, like the cities like uh, Iconium, uh, Lystra, Derbe, and you'll get Pisidian Antioch. All these cities that Paul planted churches in, in the southern Galatian region, Paul's writing a letter to these churches because these churches had a problem. When Paul left... He left with the gospel in their hands. He preached the gospel. He taught it. People accepted it. They came to Jesus. They were transformed. They were living a totally new life, gospel-focused. And then there were these false teachers who came in and taught a false gospel. They started saying, Jesus is good, but you see, you still need to get circumcised. You still need to obey the law of Moses, and then you'll be okay with God then you'll be righteous. But without it, Christ isn't enough. And Paul fiercely fights against that false teaching in this letter. That's really the big goal of this letter when Paul writes this. The problem with this false teaching, saying that, hey, Christ is good, Jesus is good, but you need something more. You still need to keep the law, and without that, you can't be saved. You can't become righteous. The problem with that teaching is that it is burdensome. It is stifling. What God intended to do when he gave us Jesus to die for our sins, to pay our penalty on that cross, and to defeat death and the consequences of sin once and for all as he rose from the grave and he showed us the empty tomb and he gave us life in eternity, life in abundance, When God did that, he wanted us to enjoy freedom. For freedom, Christ set us free. But then when we turn back to say, wait, 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 maybe we were freed, but now in order to keep this freedom, we need to continue to abide by the law. And if we don't, then we are falling and we don't have salvation anymore. When you start to think that way, you lose every opportunity to be free. God says, I'm going to adopt you into my family as my son and as my daughter. Do you know what that means? That means you don't have to earn a spot. You're given a spot at the table. You don't sit at the dinner table because you've earned it and you worked eight hours today and you were a good boy or a good girl so that you have a place in this family. No, you don't do that. You see, when my son Nathan does something wrong and he knows he did something wrong, he comes and sometimes he asks me, Daddy, do you still love me? I've been trying to teach him, Nathan, why do I love you? And because i said it so many times, he knows now. He says, you love me because I'm your son. I say, yes, exactly. And you're still my son. I don't like what you did. What you did was wrong, and you need to say sorry, and we need to work on being better next time. Absolutely. 
Yes, there is a law. There's a rule that's good for you to keep. It's absolutely good for you. But the law doesn't make you. The rules of our household doesn't make you a son in my family. It doesn't make me love you any more or any less. It's only by the fact that you are my son that you will always have my love. Even when you fail, even when you're kicking and screaming and going against what I've taught you, I will still love you in that very moment simply because you're my son. Now, of course, I'm not perfect at this. I get angry, and I'm, I'm not a good parent all the time. I get that. But our God is a good father all the time. He's faithful. He doesn't change. He never disappoints. He never fails. What this means is God is inviting you to a relationship where your righteousness isn't based on the fact that you kept his law. Even though his law is beautiful and good and we should keep them, absolutely. But it's not, it's, it's not a determiner of your status in his family. The only determiner of your status as heirs to the king of kings is the fact that you are his daughter, you are his son. And do you know how that was achieved? Not by what, not by what you've done, but by what Jesus Christ has done. His perfect life his sacrificial and atoning death, his triumph over death in that empty grave. That, that's what allowed us to enter into God's presence as his children, as his heirs. And we will never lose this. This is what Paul was trying to stress to the Galatians. You can walk with God because your right to walk with the Spirit of God wasn't given because you were good and you'll lose it if you're not. No, no, you get to walk with God because you're his child. So the danger of the false teachers and what they've been teaching in the churches of Galatia was that you wouldn't appreciate the grace that was available for you. You would not know the, the grandeur of God's love for you. And Paul didn't want the Galatians to live this way. Think about Exodus where Israel, Israel comes out miraculously by God's leading. They come out of slavery from Egypt and they're entering into the promised land. But because times were hard, because there was a lot of struggle in the wilderness, what do they say? The Israelites often say, I'd rather be back in Egypt and a slave. Moses, why did you bring us out? Why did your God bring us out? What's with this? I would rather be in Egypt. At least we would have food. I would live as a slave. I'd rather have that. And then, of course, Moses would be like, what are you thinking? It doesn't make any sense. God is giving you the promised land. He's giving you his promise to make you his people. Why would you want to live as a slave? And Paul is feeling very similarly here with the Galatian church. God wants to adopt you as his children, why would you want to go back to living as slaves, trying to earn his favor, trying to think, oh man, if I don't earn his favor, if I fail, I'm knocked out of this family, I'm not a part of it anymore, but if I do well, I can keep, keep at it. God doesn't want that pressure on you, and God knows you can't handle it. That's why Paul says here, you need the Spirit of God. Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. Paul is teaching us, and God is teaching us. In order for you to fight the sins of this world, in order for you to have a chance to navigate through this broken world well, you need his spirit. Don't try to say, I will do better. I will try harder. I got to become good. No. Trust the Holy Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. Be led by His Spirit. That's the answer. So, well, you might ask, what does that look like, Paul? What does it look like to be led by the Holy Spirit? What does it look like to be walking in step with the Spirit of God? Well, in a simple way, we can put it like this. Surrender your life to the Spirit of God. Let the Holy Spirit rule your life. Let Him govern your thoughts and your mind. Let Him have full and complete reign in your life. That's what walking with the Spirit looks like. And you might say, okay, well, that sounds good, but is there any practical implications here? 
Well, Paul actually does give some practical implications. Let's continue to read. Here in verses um, 18 forward, Paul writes, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. And here he gives a comprehensive but not exhaustive list of sins in this world. Listen to what Paul lists. It says, uh, the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. So here's a hint, right? At the end, he ends, things like these. That means it's not a complete exhaustive list. However, he does give you a comprehensive list. See, what Paul's talking about isn't particular sins here. Some people misunderstand this, okay? Because later in verse 21, Paul will write something that's quite scary. He says, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Ooh, that's like scary to me, right? Some of you reading that might be like, well, Paul, I thought it was all by grace and you are, I'm not going to lose my salvation just because I stumbled, but that sounds scary. You might be just going through the list. Okay, did I do any of that today, yesterday, last week, last month? Man, did I fall in any of the rivalries, dissensions, divisions? Man. No, no, no. Paul writes things like these, meaning sinfulness in general. You cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot enter into his kingdom when you're a sinner like this. What Paul's teaching us isn't that if you sin or stumble, you don't get to go to heaven anymore. You lose your salvation. That's not the teaching. Paul's teaching here is we are not just prone to particular sins, like a, an item on this list, but we're prone to sinfulness comprehensively. We live in a world where there will constantly be a temptation for us to sin and be pulled away from God's presence. So when Paul is giving us this list, he's actually saying, if you have sin in you, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So what does he say? Is he trying to threaten them? Say, hey, you better try harder. You better keep the rules or else you're not going to make it. No, that goes against everything he taught in not only Galatians, but other letters that he writes. What Paul is trying to say is, you cannot enter the kingdom of God by being good because there's sinfulness in you. There's sinfulness in me. There's sinfulness in this world. It's the only thing that you can trust. You need Christ and what he's done. Paul will actually end this letter in Galatians by pointing the church back to Jesus Christ. He'll say, Jesus alone will save you. So if you think you can do this without Christ, if you say Christ isn't enough, we need to do more, we need to add to the works so that we can get saved, we can become righteous, Paul's saying, no, if you're depending on righteousness, by your own self-deeds and works and proven nature, then you're going to fail. He's saying you will not make it. He's pointing you back to the grace of Jesus Christ, found on his throne, found at the foot of the cross. That's where Paul wants these people to be. So when you're looking at practically, how do I then do this? If it's not about me trying harder or just keeping the rule for the rule's sake, how do I become good at walking with the Spirit of God, being led by Him? So Paul continues in verses 22 and onwards, gives us a roadmap. He writes, but the, spirit, or, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such things there is no law. I love this list. This is actually Galatians 5, verses 22, 23. That's one of the first Bible verses I've ever memorized as a child. And actually, my son, Nathan, who's, who was only three last year, last year in children's ministry, he went through the fruit of the Spirit, and he actually memorized all of them. He did crafts and songs that reminded him of the, the list here. So I want to help you out. If you've never memorized the fruit of the Spirit, this is going to hopefully help you memorize it now. Okay, in children's ministry, this is how they teach them. Okay, they do the actions, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All right, you might think, oh man, this is a little cheesy, Paul. I, I'm not following, but hey, if you're on your couch by yourself and no one's looking, just do it, do it with me. 
Okay, memorize this together. Okay, we'll take it in chunks of three, all right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. <laughs> you might be wondering, why are you even doing this, Paul? Why is it important to memorize these verses? Why is it important to know this? Well, because, like I said, this is a roadmap to understand how we would measure the fact that we're walking by the Spirit of God. You know, in any good company or good leaders will say, if you have goals, you need to have a way to measure those goals, whether we succeed or not, right? It's got to be a measurable way. There's got to be a measurable method of knowing have you attained your goal or not. You do this maybe at your workplace, but you also do this at school, right? I remember when I went to UBC a long time ago now, I guess, when I first started my uh, bachelor's degree, my first degree, it was overwhelming. There's so many courses that you needed to take. There was 100 credits that you needed to finish. There's a lot of money that's going on. There's lots of time that's needed. And I felt a little overwhelmed. As a young man, I thought, man, am I ever going to finish this degree? And it is overwhelming. The next four, five, six years, what is it going to look like? All I'm going to do is be reading and studying, writing exams. It felt like a huge burden. But then I met with an academic advisor. And like any good academic advisor would do, she sat me down and said, hey, Paul, here's what you're going to need. Here's the academic roadmap. You need six credits of sciences. So I took earth and ocean sciences and astronomy because I'm not really a good science guy, so I wanted to take some courses that I thought were easy. I was going to be an English major, so I needed an English 101, 210. I had these prerequisites that I needed to fulfill. And then, of course, I needed 12 credits of electives. And there were so many courses, but they were broken down into chunks that I could understand and fathom. And then every time I completed a course, there was a check mark next to the requirement. I would say, okay, I see where this is going. Now the 120 credits didn't seem so overwhelming after all. Yes, it was still a slow process, but I can see how I would get there. I can see every step that I would need to take. See, that's a good academic advisor. They give you a roadmap. And God gave us a roadmap. I believe this is what the fruit of the Spirit teaches us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. God is basically telling us, here's the roadmap, guys. Church, here's the roadmap. If you want to understand in a practical sense what it looks like to be led by the Holy Spirit, what it looks like to walk by the Spirit and walking in step with the Spirit, this is it. It looks like this. This is the measuring stick. This is the measurable. It will be fascinating to do a word study throughout the Bible to understand what these things mean. Do we understand what joy means? Do we understand what patience means? Do we understand what kindness means in a biblical sense? Rather than looking from the, the culture's perspective of, okay, this is what patience means, or this is what kindness means, is there a teaching in the Bible? And I, I would say, yes, there is. And I, I pray that you will take the time, maybe, to do this for homework. Look through each of these nine words that you find in the fruit of the Spirit, and do a deep dive into Scripture to understand, this is what God wants from me. He wants me to grow. He intends me to grow in these areas. God, lead me. I think it will excite your journey in faith when you do that deep study of these words. I don't have time to go into every word, or else this will be like a 12-hour sermon. But I do want to talk about one, one word in this list, and it's the word love. Love, joy, peace, and onwards. Many scholars wonder, is it a coincidence that the word love was the first word in this list? If you read Greek literature, and even in New Testament and, and Old Testament, the word order in a phrase was absolutely important. Most often, it wasn't accidental. There was no coincidence about it. When something was listed first, there was an emphasis, there was a reason for it. I agree with these scholars. I believe the word love was there first because love, love completes the law. Paul talked about it earlier in Galatians. Of course, Jesus talks about it. Of course, Deuteronomy and Old Testament talks about it. Love, 
is the fulfillment of the law. Paul would write in places like 1 Corinthians, love, the greatest of these is love. We know that Paul emphasized love. We know that God emphasized love. We know that God said he himself is love. That is the defining characteristic of our God. So why is that important here? Because if you're wanting to grow in these other things like self-control and gentleness and all sorts of things, you ought to know that it's got to be done in the backdrop or the context of love. You need to be in the arena of love in order for you to grow in this fruit of the Spirit. You know what this means? This means you have to be in relationship, first and foremost, with your God. You need to love your God, and you need to know his love for you. This is why we preach the gospel. Even if you know the contents of the gospel, this is why we preach it every day to you. This is why you should preach it to yourself every day. And remind one another in your church because you need to be empowered and motivated and inspired by the love of God when you appreciate his love for you and when you are moved to love him back and worship and praise him, that's when you will grow in all these other aspects of the fruit as well. And of course, you need to be in relationship with one another, your fellow brothers and sisters at Central Baptist Church. You need to do that because how would you ever grow in patience without someone testing it for you? How would you grow in gentleness without engaging in other human relationships? See, God intends to help us grow in the fruit of the Spirit when we engage in a healthy and loving environment, a healthy church community. So this we cannot ignore. Some people think, well, Paul, I like love, I like patience, but gentleness, that's not for me. Maybe for some of you, you say, hey, self-control, not for me. Hey, I'm sorry, I, lo- I love it, I respect that it's in the Bible, but that's not for me. God didn't wire me that way. How many times have we heard that? You know what the problem with that is? In both the English and the Greek, the fruit of the Spirit is a singular. It's not a plural. It's not fruits of the Spirit. It's not like a grocery store where you're going, okay, I like oranges, I like apples, but uh, grapes, I'm going to pass on the grapes. I don't really like them. See, sometimes we have this image of the fruit of the Spirit to be plural, so we say, okay, God gave me a lot of patience. I can work on self-control, but you know what? I don't really need to do gentleness. But no, if you really study Scripture, God wants to lead us to grow in all of this. This is singular. This is one fruit of the Spirit of God. So we have a responsibility, but also an opportunity to grow in all of these areas. So let's go back to the illustration I began with. Remember that lovely, sunny day, the glorious sun in the sky, the amazing beach, the beautiful scenery, a little bit of a breeze, You smell the ocean. You can hear the voice of the one you love. As I'm walking down this beach with Sarah, holding her hand, I'm filled with joy. As we go through that walk, as she becomes tired, I stop, and we sit on the bench, and we talk. I listen, I talk, we engage. We're holding hands still. It's a walk that expresses our love for one another. See, this is the kind of walk God invites us to. When we're on a walk with him, he doesn't want us to view him as just a list of rules that we need to keep in order to please him. He doesn't want God to be a chore in your life. He doesn't want to occupy uh, this space in your life that just has, okay, I'll give you this, God, but the rest I don't want to give. He doesn't want that kind of a relationship with you. He wants all of you. He wants to walk with you. He wants to lead you. He wants to support you. He wants to pick you up when you fall and when you fail. He's not going to ditch you because you fell. He's not going to be like, see you later, I'm off. No. He's going to sit down on the bench with you. He's going to tell you, it's okay. Let's take a little breather. But once you're ready, we can get back up and walk again. We'll get there. Don't you worry. 
I'm holding your hand. This is our God. At the very end of our text here, in, verses, in verse 25, we see that if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. The Greek phrase, keeping in step, this phrase actually is uh, used in the military sense, where you see a military, a group of soldiers marching, and they're marching in step with one another. They're so in unison, they're so united that it looks like one group, one body moving together. Everyone is perfectly aligned with one another. But when we hear war analogies and, and military terms, we think of a, maybe a taskmaster, sometimes even maybe like a slave driver, where someone has a whip and says, okay, if you're not going to do this correctly, I will whip you into shape and I will bring you to our destination. This is how it's going to work. It's true that Paul uses militaristic terms all throughout his letters and here in Galatians as well. But I think if we only see God as this taskmaster whipping you into shape so that you become good, I think you're missing the point. I think you're misunderstanding God. Because that's what the Galatians believed. They started buying into these lies, thinking that maybe that's how God is. So Paul reminds them, do you know why this fruit is called the fruit of the Spirit? Because it's his fruit. Because it's reflective of him. Because it's reflective of our Lord Jesus Christ and his spirit. He is love. His very nature defines for us what love is. So instead of imagining him with a whip in his hand, what you can imagine him as is walking with you on that beautiful, glorious walk. And when you're walking too fast and getting ahead of him, he'll slow you down. He'll hold your hand and says, walk with me. When you can't follow because you're hurting, you broke your knee, he will stoop down and mend your knee, get you better, sit down on the bench, and he will journey with you. He will never abandon you. That's the image you want. That's the picture you need when you think about your God. So here are some practical takeaways. If you want to walk with the Spirit of God this week, Spend time talking to him. Just as I spend time with Sarah on these walks, on the bench in a coffee shop, walking on the beach, do that with God. Study the scripture. Listen to what he's saying to you. And also pray to him. It's two ways, right? Conversation, listen, but also speak. Repent when you need to. When he tells you things and exposes sin in your life, repent and ask for forgiveness and ask God, where do you want to take me next? When you are overjoyed by the blessings you receive and give thanks and praise him in your prayers, worship him, not just on Sundays, but every day of your life. So studying scripture, praying, and then be surrounded and engaged with a community of God's people. Remember, you need the arena of love, the arena of God's people, in order for us to walk with the Spirit to learn to grow in the fruit of the Spirit. So you might be saying, Paul, that sounds cliche. Read Scripture, pray, and be a part of a church community. Well, I'm sorry for being cliche. But those things have been emphasized in Christianity for so many years because they are the fundamentals of how we walk with our spirit how we walk with the Spirit of God himself. And I invite you this week, take this seriously. Go into the embrace of a God who walks with you every step along this journey, especially right now through the pandemic. I pray that you will experience God leading you, walking with you, and helping you as you journey through life. Let me pray for you as we close. Father God, I thank you for the joy that we have when we open up your word and when we are blessed by the truth we find. God, if, if we ever imagined you as, as a God who has a whip in his hands, whipping us into shape, I, I want us to repent, God. Please allow us to have the right view of who you are even though you are the righteous judge, even though you are the king of kings, even though you are a warrior, a military general, God, you also are our good father. 
You are one who loves to walk with us. You are one who restores us, reconciles us, redeems us. So Father, help us to run into your embrace, to enjoy going on this walk with you. Not doing it as a chore, not doing it to check off boxes in our faith journey, but God, help us to really understand and appreciate what it's like to walk with you and to be led by your spirit. May we experience this this week as we live. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Father, because you are good. Thank you, Father, for giving us the privilege of being here today. I want to say thank you to Pastor Paul. Thank you so much for sharing this good and challenging word with us, how important it is for us to walk 
walk in step with you through our lives. If you have any questions, if you have any challenges in your life, you'd like to talk to any one of us here at Central Baptist, please do give us a call. We'd love to chat with you about your walk of life. I'd like to close our service with this benediction from the end of Paul's little letter to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians specifically. He closes this little letter by saying this, and I believe it really ties into what Pastor Paul was teaching us this morning. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. So go in the strength and the peace of God to love and serve him with all your heart. We look forward to seeing uh, some of you at least here in the building next Sunday. God bless you. Go in peace. Amen.